All right, so hopefully uh, y'all can hear me in the back. Um, I can't believe I just said y'all. Uh, I've been in, in the South too long. Um, I just want to thank the organizers uh, of this wonderful symposium uh, for inviting me to come and give you a little bit of uh, uh, sort of a primer of what we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, I also want to thank them for gathering such a diverse uh, body of scientists uh, with different disciplines. I think uh, it's very important as we, you know, sometimes stick in our departmental silos to kind of think outside the box and look at people who work on very diverse things uh, to foster collaborations. And I want to specifically thank Gus uh, for putting this together. So um, what I wanted to start out with is, is really just to kind of give you a little bit of background on the organism with which we study, uh, which are spotted fever group or catch species. In this case, I'm going to primarily be focusing on the etiologic agent of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Rickettsia rickettsii. Okay, so many of you might not exactly know what Rickettsia are. They're gram-negative obligate intracellular pathogens uh, that are transmitted by arthropod vectors into uh, mammalian hosts. Okay, uh, as their name implies, they're obligate intracellular pathogens. So unlike our colleagues in the Coxiella field. Uh, we have not figured out a way in which to grow these organisms outside of a, of a cell or in broth or in any sort of exenic media. Okay, so obviously that uh, produces a, uh, some limitations into some of the studies that we can do. Uh, in terms of uh, a public health perspective, these are re-emerging uh, infectious diseases. Uh, they're biosafety level three organisms. Thankfully, uh, we have those facilities here at the LSU SVM, many of which are listed as uh, on a variety of different lists as, as select agents or potential agents for bioterrorism and, and, and biowarfare. There are historically important organisms or causative agents of important diseases. The ones that I'll primarily focus on today are uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And so, you know, this is a bioinformatics sort of ge genomics kind of uh, type of symposium. And so I wanted to put in a, a little bit of that. So um, the genomes of these organisms are very small. Okay, so there's about 1.1 and 1.2 megabases. And for Rickettsia rickettsii, that translates into about 1,300 genes, okay? If you compare that, for example, to laboratory strains of E. coli, they're about anywhere between 4.5 and 5 megabases in size. And so what this says is that there's been a lot of reductive evolution uh, within Rickettsia species. And we know that for a fact because we've sequenced a variety of different genomes uh, from different Rickettsia species. And what we find is that they've essentially lost a lot of biosynthetic and metabolic uh, pathway genes. Uh, but have uh, essentially adapted themselves to uh, use transporter proteins um, and, 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 other, uh, and other factors in order to sop up nutrients from uh, this nutrient-rich uh, place in the cell that we call the cytoplasm and cytosol. Okay? So these organisms um, can bind to and invade or trigger their own internalization uh, into normally non-phagocytic cells. Okay? So they have very specific mechanisms which to do that. And my lab is focused on this last part, like seven, eight years, uh, understanding the molecular details of that interaction. Okay? So they're able to get into epithelial cells, endothelial cells, monocytes, macrophages, and they're able to proliferate uh, to very high levels within these cells, at least in vitro. And hopefully I'll convince you that some of that happens in vivo as well. Okay, so what, is, what are some of the clinical symptoms, uh, at least in humans? So these are seasonal infections, and that's because of, of the essentially uh, the availability uh, of the, the vector, in this case the tick, uh, to feed uh, and to molt and, and go through its developmental cycle. And so we are not a normal host for these organisms. So these are maintained primarily in nature, either uh, in the vector itself, in this case a tick, or in some sort of small mammal it finds in the environment, voles, mice, deer, and so forth. Okay? We're the accidental tourist on, on, on this life cycle. So when we get bit by a tick, you don't get that like sort of itchy response, so you might not even know that you're bitten by one. Uh, the tick takes a blood meal, and through a mechanism that actually a colleague in my in our department, Dr. Kevin McLuso, is trying to elucidate, is how do they actually uh, how, how does the, the contents of that uh, infected tick actually make its way and be transmitted into the mammalian host? Once it does that, uh, it's a fairly vasculotropic disease, uh, as can be depicted by this petechial rash. You get these like micro hemorrhages, hemorrhages that go along from the extremities back to the trunk. Some of the symptoms that makes this disease fairly difficult to diagnose is that uh, the disease symptoms are, are very flu-like in nature. 
okay, at least initially. And so they include headache, fever, rash, other flu-like symptoms, and could result in a necrotic lesion or an eschar or a tachyla at the site of a tick bite. Uh, this is not uh, universally, uh, this is not universal for every rickettsial, pathogenic rickettsial species, okay? In uh, the more severe manifestations of disease, often leading to fatality, what you see is that there's a uh, uh, social associated with pulmonary edema, some interstitial pneumonia, although that's debatable, uh, acute renal failure, some skin necrosis, uh, infections of the kidneys, infections of the spleen, infections of, 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 of the liver, uh, usually leading to multi-organ failure. Now, one of the things that is interesting is that it can be treated with antibiotics such as doxycycline, okay? That window of efficacy is very short. Usually these infections and the, the symptoms start to manifest themselves anywhere between three to seven days post tick bite, okay? Now, if you don't treat it within um, that sort of efficacious period, it seems like the antibiotics are no longer able to control the infection um, and, and sometimes lead into a high degree of morbidity and mortality. Now, depending on whose epidemiological studies that you uh, believe and read, uh, this can vary anywhere between uh, 10 to 20 percent, both in the United States, North America, Central and South America. Okay? And what's important for the NIH is that there is no available, commercially available vaccine at the moment, although we're trying to work on it. Okay, so what's the overarching goal of the lab? So, so we want to elucidate how this particular obligate intracellular pathogen is causing severe disease in humans and possibly in companion animals, although we are primarily focused on what's going on uh, in the human, okay? And so my lab has spent a considerable amount of time looking to see, you know, the surface proteome of this bacterium, what are the putative virulence factors. Uh, as an obligate intracellular pathogen, it has to trigger its entry into a cell in order to gain the nutrients to make essentially more of itself. And so we've done a, a lot of cell biology and trying to understand the molecular details of those initial interactions with the thought being that if we can block those critical interactions, maybe we can develop some preventatives and therapeutics to block, for example, adhesin receptor interactions that are critical for this internalization process. Okay, so we've developed some models. This is a C3H HEN model of, of fatal recapsule disease. And what we can do, we can introduce the, the organism through a variety of different ways into the animal. In this case, it's uh, intravenous or intravascular inoculation through the retroorbital route. And what I want you to just focus on here is that if you put, for example, just mock treat them with PBS, and obviously they don't die. If you give them uh, essentially fatal doses of, of, of rickettsia, IV, uh, they progressively get sicker until they start losing body weight and eventually die. Okay. If we, we could look at the loads of these organisms within the infected tissues, and we primarily focus on, in this particular study, the spleen, the liver, and the lung. We've since expanded it to look at the brain, kidneys, and, and, and other organs and tissues of the animal. But what I want you to take home is that we can just focus on the black lines here, is that in a temporal fashion, we can see the progression of this bacterium through the animal, okay? So we'll sacrifice animals at different days post-infection, you can see here, uh, we have a quantitative PCR assay, which uh, essentially looks at the ratio of genomes of rickettsia for genomes of uh, murin actin. And so we can get a, a quantitative uh, assessment of the loads at that particular time point. Okay? So this, uh, you see these black dots here, there's a little bit of load in the spleen, there's pretty much nothing at day one in the liver. This kind of, you sort of have this sort of inverse relationship is that as you start to clear it in the spleen, you start to get more infection in the, in the liver and see that this scale is off by a log here. And so by the time we're sacrificing the animal, the animal is going down because when you touch it, it basically doesn't move anymore. There's more genomes of rickettsia within the liver than there are genomes of the, of the, of the mouse, okay? So it's a heavy, just massive tissue destruction that hopefully you can appreciate on the next slide. And I apologize, I didn't realize I've forgotten that we were sort of in a theater here. Uh, and I promise you that this is the only pathology that I'll show. Um, so this is a liver and this is a spleen. So, this is a, so these little purple guys right here are essentially the only healthy tissue left in this liver. And all of this is necrosis, okay, and infiltrates 
of, of uh, immunomodulatory cells. We can take these same sections and stain them with uh, specific antibodies against the, uh, the bacterium to try to see the localization of this, of this bug within the infected tissues. What you can see here is that it essentially correlates with what we see with quantitative PCR. There's a massive amount of infection within this liver tissue uh, compared to what you see in the spleen, although you see them uh, within these sort of uh, kind of apoptotic cells here. Uh, what you possibly don't appreciate here is that there's a multiple uh, cell types that are being infected in particular within the liver. So there's, uh, you get these formation of what are turned by our pathologist, uh, Dr. Fabio Del Piero, who's a collaborator on this study, uh, these micro abscesses that have essentially have sort of coalesced and turned into these macro abscesses. And these are filled with uh, hepatocytes, dying hepatocytes, Kupfer cells and, and, and other uh, immunoregulatory cells. Um, they appear to be infecting these cells and also proliferating within them. Um, the organism, there's sort of um, kind of a question as to how does the organism disseminate through the animal during these uh, infections. Uh, we have evidence that not only do they colonize the endothelium, but they also colonize, colonize and circulate within infected monocytes that circulate within, uh, within the vanules. Okay? So it looks like not only are they infecting these cells to get picked up in, in, in the bloodstream, but maybe home to the infected tissue and ultimately get released there. And this is an active study that we're pursuing. Okay? But as you can see and appreciate is that these organisms are very likely sensing signals that are significantly different in this tissue than they are when you're growing them in vitro in the laboratory. Okay, so we typically uh, grow uh, these species of bacteria in African green, African green monkey kidney cells, or viral cells, or HeLa cells, or fibroblastic cells. Okay, but we grow them in, obviously in monolayers, and you know, being fed with fetal bowling serum, which is not the same environment that they're going to see when they're disseminating through the animal and causing fatal disease. Okay. So the hypothesis that we wanted to explore using existing and emerging technologies is that you know, Rickettsia are likely exposed to very distinct signals in vivo compared to those that they observe when they're being cultivated in vitro. And that we predict that bacteria are going to respond accordingly and potentially up and down regulate their, some sort of pro, uh, transcriptional program in order for them to cause the disease <clears throat> and ultimately sort of exacerbate the pathogenesis and the progression of the disease, okay? And so what we thought was that, well, we have these technologies within our department and it'd be a shame to not use them, okay? And we were trying to explore very distinct questions that at the time were really outside the box of what my laboratory was doing, okay? And so this was essentially the workflow that we did this is a collaborative and team effort uh, that, was, that was done by uh, myself, by uh, members of Biomed, uh, particularly Vladimir Chilchenko, uh, by Drs. Kim, who are in the audience here. And they all participated in, and made a significant contribution to the things that we were doing here. And so th this was essentially what, what we tried to do as a pilot study. And so we took total RNAs from bacteria that we had uh, purified from heavily infected in vitro cells or, or viral cells. And then we essentially took uh, Rickettsia or Rickettsia murine tissue, in this case, the liver and the spleen. As, and we specifically chose the liver and the spleen for, for a couple different reasons. One, we knew the pathology that had occurred within those tissues. And two, we knew the loads, okay? And then, well, actually three, and then reviewers of, of the grants and study section wanted to see whether or not we could sort of what it was the, uh, uh, the sensitivity of this assay. So could we get solid, reliable data from a tissue that was not very well infected, in this case the spleen, and one that was heavily infected, in, in this case the liver. Okay. So we performed you know, cDNA libraries using uh, these kits. Uh, we analyzed these samples on the ion, uh, proton system that's available in our department. This is just for, for reference on what we did. Uh, the initial data analysis was, was performed using uh, the, the, uh, the Torrance uh, suite software, and then additional analysis was performed by GeneLab and CCT uh, using the RNA-seq pipeline and Partex software. Okay, 
So as Jim alluded to yesterday, you know, this is the, the infamous Excel file, right? And so what is the stuff that you get back after all of this type of experimentation and analysis, okay? So we get back all sorts of diagrams, all sorts of things, and quality control of the data, but you get this sort of what I hope to be somewhat more user-friendly Excel file. <clears throat> And what I want you to appreciate here, and this is just a snapshot of, of some of the genes here, and I specifically chose this for the following reasons, is that these are some of the genes that were most highly upregulated in both the liver and in the spleen in comparison to the transcriptional profile of rickettsia isolated from in vitro cell culture, okay? So the hypothesis being that maybe these upregulated genes are being specifically induced in vivo and they contribute to pathogenesis. Okay, now, one of the things that you might notice here is that, I don't know if you can read this in the back, but the vast majority of these genes are these guys, hypothetical proteins. And this is one of sort of the bottlenecks of getting these, you know, sort of large data sets, is that it's really dependent if you're looking for, you know, certain genes that are up and down regulated, it's really dependent on how well that genome is annotated. And unfortunately for pretty much all the rickettsial species, um, the vast majority of the genome, or a really good percentage of the genome, seems to be non-annotatable, as in there are no homologs in any sort of database that align to any other species, any other bacterial species, uh, other than other rickettsial species, okay? So there's all these hypotheticals. And so one of the questions is, you know, what do you do with this data, okay? And so one can look at this, and I, and I want to echo, uh, sort of paraphrase a lyric of one of our uh, genius rap musicians, the notorious B.I.G., uh, is saying sometimes this just leads to mo data, mo problems. And so no one got that reference. Wow. Um, so what we wanted to determine is that in particular, you know, we can look at some of these things that are annotated, but I was really interested in seeing, you know, what is it that, you know, these potential hypothetical ones are. And if you look at these values, you know, it's like 76 fold upregulated over in vivo, 133 fold upregulated over in vivo, 369 upregulated over in vivo. And so we, we essentially had to do this manually. And when I say we, I mean I. And so I would take these genes look them up, look up sequences. It turns out that these, uh, essentially these bottom three don't appear to code for a protein and are very likely regulatory or non-coding RNAs, <clears throat> okay? And then I took this guy here and I said, okay, he's pretty important, about 76, 76-fold uh, 76 upregulation over in vitro. We see this not only in liver, but we also see it in the spleen. But what is it? So I took that through, through BLAST, it aligns to absolutely nothing other than homologs of other rickettsial genes, okay? But there was a little section of it that said conserved domain, okay? And there was a, a, a helix turn helix motif that was present in all of, and not only this putative uh, protein, but also in all of the homologs. And so I like playing with some, you know, I, at the limit of my bioinformatics sort of expertise, is playing with some of these structural sort of prediction programs. And so what I did was like, all right, well, let's just take that sequence, put it through the FIRE2 server that's out of England and figure out if it actually aligns to anything and if it can be modeled over an existing protein. And maybe that might give us an idea into what that upregulation could potentially mean biologically. Okay, so this is just a summary of uh, the sort of keg pathway analysis of, of some of the genes uh, that we are able to put into different pathways and categories, okay? And so this is one of the essentially pipelines that you can do uh, in saying, okay, well, I've got all this data. Now I can group them into certain uh, potential pathways, and maybe that analysis might actually give me an idea of the biology of the organism as it's traversed, as it's disseminating through this animal, okay? Now, as you can see here, this is kind of echo here, the vast majority of the up and down regulated genes are these hypothetical proteins, okay? Uh, there's down regulation of tRNA synthesis. Uh, we were really interested in, in surface uh, proteins. That's sort of the, the, 
the bread and butter of the lab, trying to figure out what the protective antigens are and what they, how they contribute to pathogenesis. <laughs> but there's a variety of different things that really I would never have thought of even exploring had I not gotten these data sets back. So there's like translation and, and some biogenesis. There's a lot of metabolic genes that go up, some lipid transport, uh, envelope and outer membrane protein uh, turnover, lipopolysaccharide, uh, increase in th synthesis, potentially modification. And so you start kind of grouping these things and you start thinking to yourself, okay, out of this big gamish of stuff, what am I going to focus on? And what is my primary interest? Okay. And so I'll get back to that hypothetical protein in the next slide here. And so there's no amino acid homolog to other bacterial proteins. And we did this with BLAST-P and, and it's basically, it doesn't align to anything other than Riquetta homolog, as I said. But when I put this through the FIRE2 server, the, the analysis and the results that came back at essentially a 99.6% confidence level was a structural homology to this, what's a protein called Lex-A transcriptional activator from Escherichia coli. And this is universally conserved amongst gram-negative enterics and other uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria. Now, why is this potentially important? Why would I be interested in this? It's involved in the bacterial SOS response. And so what's, what happens is that as bacteria in, in, uh, encounter some sort of stress, usually it's some DNA damaging stress uh, by UV light or some other or, or chemicals or, or some other stress that is yet to be identified. Um, you get upregulation of a bunch of different genes, which results in decreased gene expression of carbohydrate and amino acid metabolism and transport which is exactly what we saw in our RNA-seq data set, okay? And so it's interesting. I'm interested in elucidating the mechanisms of pathogenesis for this class of organisms. And it looks like, at least in some other systems, the upregulation of genes uh, involved in the SOS stress response are also involved in pathogenesis of a variety of different bacterial pathogens. Uh, in this case, uropathogenic E. <coughs> coli, as it gets into the bladder, causes cystitis, and actually it migrates up into the kidneys causing pyelonephritis. Okay, so maybe blast homology might not necessarily tell you or guide you in a particular way, but again, there's a variety of other tools uh, that could be potentially utilized in order to give you an idea as to where to steer your research. Okay, so these are some of the genes of interest that we validated that are of interest of us for our lab. Um, again, a lot of these are involved in uh, outer membrane proteins, uh, lipopolysaccharides. Uh, I'll direct you to a poster uh, of a student, uh, uh, Victoria Verhovey, uh, who's in Kevin Macaluso's lab, uh, who did a similar study uh, looking at uh, Rickettsia felis in a variety of different, both transmitting and non-transmitting vectors. And it's kind of an interesting thing is that when you look at the actual data sets of the up and down regulated genes, completely different species, completely different environments, and yet the bacteria appear to have a conserved pattern in how they respond to whatever stress is being perceived in the vector and in the host, okay? And so there seems to be some sort of commonality, and maybe the stresses are the same within the vector as they are in the host, or they just have some sort of pro uh, program that allows them to adapt very quickly, all right? So then it's, you know, we've got these genes, we've validated these by, you know, quantitative RT-PCR, they're a particular, of a particular threshold, um, and we could argue as to what that cutoff should be. I've seen RNA-seq papers in anaplasma and ehrlichia that call things uh, with a confidence level you know, of full changes of 0.5 to 1, okay? So I guess it all depends on where you want to set that bar and potentially who the reviewers of that manuscript and grant are. Okay, so what I wanted to conclude is, well, it's possible to analyze the transcriptome of bacteria isolated from complex samples. Okay, what I didn't tell you is that as we're processing these samples, uh, we used a variety of different commercially available kits to deplete host RNAs. It turns out it doesn't really matter because one, and I hope I'm not insulting anybody who works for those companies, but they're very bad at getting rid of host RNA. Okay, either there's too much of it, or you've got to go through multiple rounds to try to enrich it. It turns out with these platforms, it doesn't seem to matter. They're so high throughput and so robust 
and you're sequencing millions and millions of reads, that with a small genome like rickettsia, it tends not to matter. Okay? So we are still able to get from the in vitro isolated samples uh, a completeness in terms of depth coverage of 880x coverage of the genome and in 35 and 33x respectively coverage of the genome from the liver and the spleen. Okay? Still a big amount of data and from an infected tissue that did not appear by any metric that we measured was heavily infected. Okay, so you don't have to have a lot of bacteria within that tissue to actually get good reliable data. So the transcriptional profile, we can obviously see differs dramatically when rickettsia rickettsia is in a host than when it's not in a host or when it's being grown in culture. And now the big question is, what do you do with that? So you've got these things that can go up and down, stable. What do you do? Well, you write grants. Okay? You try to convince the NIH to fund some of these research projects because we feel they're important. Um, modification of LPS is a very much known virulence determinant in a variety of different public health important pathogens. Neisseria meningitidis, Yersinia pestis, uh, Salmonella, uh, Coxiella. It's just has never been explored for any of the recessive diseases. Okay. Uh, there was specific uh, secretion machineries called the type 4 secretion machinery. Again, this is very important pathogenesis of Helicobacter pylori, uh, Anaplasma, uh, Phagocytophilum, Ehrlichia chaffiensis. It is not really well understood what the significance of that is for recessive species. The SOS response. We have absolutely no idea what's going on, but we know that this is being dramatically induced at the transcriptional level during a fatal infection in a murine model of disease. Okay. Now, the simple thing, if you're in the E. coli or salmonella world, would be, well, knock it out. Knock out that gene and then see what the mutant how the mutant behaves both in vitro and in the animal. Well, it's not that simple and straightforward for rickettsial species uh, and a very talented research assistant professor who was working in my labs uh, by the name of Dr. Sean Riley, who's sitting in the back over there. And he's developing uh, methodologies using flow cytometry and cell sorting in order to isolate clonal populations of, of what we hope will be uh, isogenic mutants that were generated here at LSU. Now, I want to acknowledge a, a lot of people uh, who were instrumental, uh, not only in recruiting me here to LSU from the University of Chicago, uh, but also in helping me develop a successfully funded research program. Uh, I've already mentioned Sean Riley, uh, Abigail Fish, Lizzie Griggs, Pedro Curto, and, and Daniel Garza are current members of my lab, and they're very, working very hard, again, trying to figure out how these bacteria are causing disease. Uh, the collaborators at CCT, uh, uh, Jushan Kim and Nayeon Kim, who did all the analysis. I'm very, uh, very thankful for their efforts in this. Uh, and then, uh, again, instrumental people here from Biomed, Gus Kasulis, Vladimir Shevchenko, and Ramesh, um, who were uh, really helpful in us in organizing and actually doing the work of, of uh, generating these libraries and ultimately running the sequencers. And again, the alumni from my lab who have helped me uh, get to the point where I am today, and obviously NIH for keeping the lights on. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. Planning to do about that um, on one protein that you identified that uh, hypothetical protein that was on the request. Are you planning to do something about it? Yeah, so um, I was hoping to you know bump into it and sort of pique the interest of anybody who's working on transcription factors. Uh, this is obviously not something that I work on, but it could foster some sort of collaboration of trying to look at the genomic level. Uh, to find signatures of, say, lexate binding sites within these genes, uh, and try to figure out how, with our RNA seq data, how is it correlated? You know, are, is this really a lex A responsive element, uh, and can we find it through the genome, and can we validate it uh, in vitro? Ideally, what I would love to do, if, if it's technologically possible, is to knock out lex A, and then see how it behaves in a variety of different in vitro stresses, 
and then stick it into an animal and see how it behaves. You know, is it is it critical for it to induce this very distinct transcriptional program, and does that contribute to pathogenesis? Uh, yes. Okay. So you talked about the response of the rickettsia to stresses. So that would mean to signals in contact in the cell. Do you know what those signals are? No, so, so that cell response to the rickettsia. Yeah, so so that's the beauty of, of using this RNA seq technology is that you do all the sequencing reactions and the filtering is just alignment to the reference genome. And so we can take the data and align it to the mirroring genome and we can do it in a temporal fashion. And so that's actually something that uh, we fortunately got funded for uh, to do in this renewal. Because my second question would be, are those types of signals from the cell the same when it's infected with a different type of bacteria? Because there are other diseases like this, where bacteria enter the cell. Would the same cell send the same signal, same cell type, or do they react differently depending on which? Yeah, so, so I mentioned a, a, a few of them, which happen to also be obligated to cellular pathogens. Rickettsia are, are non vacuolar and so they get inside the cell and very quickly break out of that end zone. Uh, species like Coxiella or Lichia and, and you know, Legionella for that matter, which is not an obligate, but uh, live inside a phagosome and, and modify that intracellular trafficking to get that vacuole to be supported for replication. So that environment or that microenvironment is vastly different than what you see in, uh, in the cytoplasm. And that's something that, I mean, those data sets are available, but that's something that we can utilize to compare. In the same vein, may I ask you a question, Juan? Yes. What do you think is the stress condition that's inducing that Lexa is clearly not UV inside? Yeah. Um, you know, we know they undergo, um, uh, and this is all based on in vitro studies, of course. Um, they, they undergo uh, reactive uh, oxygen uh, intermediates. Um, that's 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 what I thought it is because if you go to your first slide, there is thyroid oxygen oxidases and cytochrome yeah. oxidases that are being induced. So yes, yeah, so sure. there's a neutrophil burst type. Yeah. So it's it, interesting you should say that because there is. Um, so yeah, so there's recruitment at, at least in in vivo in the animal. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is that we found that you know they're in these monocytes and, and, and macrophages. Uh, they grow very fairly tiny tiger when they're, again, in vitro, when in, uh, they're in these THP1 cells. Now, if we activate them, will they survive? Or is there something that you should take like interferon gamma or something, or, or LPS and pre-stimulate them? Do they now be, do those cells now become refractory towards replication? Um, and it's something that we can model in vitro. Uh, and again, we could utilize RNA-seq to figure out, well, within this, putatively in vitro stressed model, can we replicate the transcriptional profile that Rickettsia observes in, in vivo in an in vitro setting? Yes. So uh, how do Rickettsia internalize into the host cell? Through the endocytosis or kind of direct? You know, no, they, they utilize, so we've identified at least two adhesin receptor pairs that are sufficient to do this. Uh, one of which is uh, the collagen receptor, so it's alpha 2 beta 1 integrin. Uh, the other one is this funky protein that's expressed in the nucleus and the cytoplasm and at the plasma membrane of endothelial cells. Um, and so, and also in epithelial cells. Um, and so it utilizes these two adhesin receptor pairs and they coordinate their activity in order to get inside the cell. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oops.